This is going to be a very simple first principles type lesson. It's going to be one that is easy to understand, but at the same time, I think it's a very powerful lesson. I'm going to be talking about salvation and what it means to be in Christ and what it takes to get into Christ. As you know, there's lots of confusion in the religious world on what it means to be saved and what we as Christians are supposed to do and teach about living the Christian life. Unfortunately, we have many today who have the buffet mentality when it comes to what God's Word teaches. Most people love a buffet because you have access to all kinds of different food and you can pick and choose what you want. And I don't know about all the United States, because I don't know where all these restaurants are, but I'm sure you've had something similar. But one of my favorite places to eat at, or used to be to eat at, is the Golden Corral. I mean, that place had all kinds of food. I mean, you could just choose, pick and choose your favorites and do whatever you wanted to do. They even had a chocolate fountain. I mean, you could take strawberries and your fruit and you could run it in there. You know, I mean, you could put anything underneath there. Maybe, you know, ah, no. <laughs> I know I was tempted to do that sometimes. That's some really good chocolate covering it has on there. But the point is, there's lots of things for you to choose from and you can leave things behind. That's that buffet type mentality. Or I think of another restaurant that I had here locally. Again, I don't know if you had one of these in your particular state, but we had one that's called Ryan's. Kind of similar to Golden Corral, but it was it even had more selection. Lots of desserts. You know, I, if I'm paying money for a buffet, I might every once in a while get a salad. I know that's good for you. But if I'm paying money to eat, I'm going to go get the stuff I want. I want to get the good stuff, the meat, the desserts, the, the bread. Oh, man, I, can, I, I love their bread. They had this honey butter. Well, I'm probably just making you hungry. But anyway, here's the idea is that you can pick and choose what you want when you're eating at a buffet. Nothing wrong with that. That's your right to do. But as I said, many people apply this type of mentality when it comes to the Bible. And it's sad whenever they do that because what they want to do is they want to pick and choose the things in the Bible that they like and then go past the other parts. You know, we see people do this all the time. This is how we have so many different uh, religions out there. They pick and choose what doctrine they want to follow or they add things. Uh, to whatever God's Word says, just so they can have their own way. They want it their way instead of God's way. And again, I think, I think it's very sad whenever people do that because whenever people continue to do that, they're just getting themselves further and further away from God. You know, we cannot have that type of mentality when it comes to God's Word. Did you know even atheists, they can find things in God's Word even they don't believe in God. And they just think maybe the Bible is just some man-made book or whatever. They can even find things in there that they like. I'm sure they would want someone to treat them with kindness. Or they like the idea of how it's talking about people being generous and helping others and things like that. Or maybe even how the apostles said, hey, let's go fishing. You know, I mean, there's all kinds of things that people can find in bits and pieces. But if we're going to love God and we're going to follow His instructions, we got to follow all that he says, the things that we like and the things that we don't like. You know, Paul had some fellow Jews who kind of had that mentality that many people have today. In Romans 10 and verse 2, it says, For I bear witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted to the righteousness of God. You know, until we can get people to understand that we have to go by the sum of God's Word, that's S-U-M and not S-O-M-E. So whenever we go by the sum of God's Word, then we'll be able to see the complete picture of what God wants from us. You know, whenever you open up a, a puzzle box and you examine just one piece of that puzzle, maybe you see something that looks kind of like a dog. You can say, well, there's a dog in this picture. Well, I think that's a dog. Well, if that's all you have, you don't get to see the complete picture. You don't have a clue what else is in that picture. Or even if that thing that looks like a dog isn't actually a dog. And so you got to put all the pieces together to be able to see the complete picture. The same concept is true when it comes to the Bible. We must take all the verses the Bible says about a particular topic, and so we can put it all together to have a complete picture 
so that we can know exactly everything we need to know about that topic. A classic example of this can be observed in the story of Jesus' arrest. Matthew and Mark's account both teach that one of those that was with Jesus drew his sword and struck off the ear of the high priest's servant. You can see that in Matthew 26, verse 51, and Mark 14, verse 47. From this one piece of the puzzle, we have no idea who struck the servant, which ear was cut off, or what the servant's name was. Well, the next piece of this puzzle is found in Luke's account. He informs us that the high priest's servant's right ear was cut off and that Jesus healed it, Luke 22, verse 50. All right, we're starting to get more information here. Now, John, he's going to make the picture complete. John teaches us that Simon Peter was the one who cut off the high priest's servant's right ear, and we find out that his name was Malchus, John 18, verse number 10. So it took all of these parts, all these little pieces of the puzzle, in order to make the complete picture so we can know everything and all the different, de different details about what happened at that situation. Which ear was cut off, what his name was, how Jesus healed it, and all of these different things. And so we have to do the exact same thing when it comes to what the Bible says about salvation. Let me give you one more example. This is a thought question. I want you to imagine that there is a man that is struggling to stay alive. He's going down the river. He somehow fell in the river. We don't know how he got there, but this is a fast-paced river. I mean, he's got his arms up and he's saying, help, help. Well, there happens to be a man that's fishing on the bank. And I mean, he's sitting back. He's taking it easy. He has his hat on over his eyes. He's got his fishing pole in his hand. He's just waiting to fill something, you know, jar the pole so that he knows when he's got a bite. Well, he starts hearing this man yell. So he starts looking around, looking for this man, and he sees him. And he just happens to have a rope that he had brought with him. So he takes that rope and he throws it out there and it happens to land in the best spot. And the man in the river grabs a hold of the rope. And then the man on the bank, he starts pulling the man in and the man manages, and the river manages to keep his grip on the rope and he pulls him uh, to safety. So using critical thinking, what saved this man in the river? What saved him? Did his yelling save him? Yes, but not by itself because yelling, it got the attention of the man on the bank, but if there was no man there, his cry for help would not have been heard and it wouldn't have helped him any. So did the man on, uh, on the bank save the guy from the river? Yes, but again, not by himself, because if he hadn't heard the man yelling or happened to have a rope, then the man would not have been able to save him because he would have just had to watch him go by. Now, the rope itself played a part of saving this man as well, because if there wasn't a rope, then there would be no way for him to throw that out to him and for him to be able to grab a hold of it. And so we can see that the rope was very important in this. Now, did the rope save him by itself? No, of course not. Because whenever he threw that out there, he had to throw it just at the right spot so that the man in the river could reach it, grab a hold of it. Then the man had to grab a hold of it and hang on tight. And then the man on the bank had to have enough strength to pull him in. And so here's the point. If we look at this situation, we can see there are a lot of things that saved this man but it took all of those things working together. You had to have every piece of the puzzle in place for that man to be able to be saved. And again, that's exactly what we must do when it comes to salvation. We can't just take a verse over here that talks about being saved and or maybe dra drag another verse over here. No, you gotta use them all. It's all the different things combined together. You know, some will say that we're saved by grace alone. Now, it is true that we are saved by the grace of God, Ephesians 2, verse number 8, but we are not saved by grace alone. If that were true, everyone who has ever lived and ever will live would be saved no matter what they do. We wouldn't need our Bibles, wouldn't need any of that stuff, because we could say, well, we have God's grace, so we're saved. Jesus did it for us, so there's nothing left for me to do. I can't do anything about it. 
I'm just saved. Thank you, Jesus. We know that's not true. As we look at the Bible and what it says about salvation, you know, we learn that grace is God's part, but we must also believe that Jesus is the Son of God. John 8, verse 24. However, faith alone doesn't justify us or save us by itself, as James tells us in James 2, verse 24. Again, this only gives us part of the picture. We have grace and we have faith. The Bible also tells us that we must repent, Luke 13, 3, or we will perish. Let me ask you some questions. Does grace save? Yes, it does. Does faith save? Yes. Does repentance save? Yes, it does. But none of these save us by themselves, or even if we combined all three of these things, it wouldn't save us because we don't have all the pieces of the puzzle. We don't have the complete picture of what the Bible says saves us. And so we have two more pieces of the puzzle we need to look at. You know, the Bible teaches us that we must confess Jesus as our Lord to be saved. Romans 10, verses 9 and 10. And finally, the last piece of the puzzle is baptism. Peter clearly tells us that baptism saves in 1 Peter 3, verse 21. And that baptism is the point our sins are forgiven, Acts 2, verse 38. So does confessing Jesus as Lord save? Yes, but not by itself. Does baptism save? Yes, it does. And even though it's when our sins are washed away, it cannot save us by itself. Just as we saw in our example of Peter, where he cut off Malchus's right ear, we have to consider all the verses that talk about becoming saved, which we just looked at which is grace, faith, repentance, confession, and being baptized. And like we learned from the man that was in the river, it takes all the things working together for us to be able to be saved, just like it was for that man. He had to have the rope, the man on the bank, and all that stuff that we talked about earlier to make it to where he was saved. And so the same thing is true when it comes to the Bible. It's very simple. We must go by all of those different things. You cannot be saved by doing part of them you have to do all of them to be able to have that complete picture and to be able to have the forgiveness of your sins. Now in this next part, I'm going to talk about the things that are found in Christ and the things that are found outside of Christ. You know, it's very important, or it should be, especially after I get finished with this part, you'll see that you want to make sure that you are in Christ. This is where you want to be, is in Christ. You don't want to be outside of Christ. That's the worst possible place that you could be. First, I want you to consider 2 Timothy 2, verse number 1. You therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And so this is where the free gift is located. It's in Christ. So here's what we have. We have grace. That is in Christ. So that means outside of Christ. That means that there is no grace. And certainly you don't want to be where there's no grace. Okay? The next verse I want to look at is Ephesians 1, verse number 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Notice it says every spiritual blessing is found in Christ. So, very simply, we know that every spiritual blessing, not, there's not one of them that's left out. It's only found in Christ. And so that means outside of Christ, guess what? There is no spiritual blessings. None to be had. And so, that's not what you want. You want those spiritual, those spiritual blessings. Now, our next verse is Colossians 2, verse number 9. It says, For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you are complete in him, who is the head of all principality and power. You know, sometimes people will say that, oh, I feel like I'm just missing something. You know, life doesn't have that much meaning. Uh, you know, all we got is to live this life and then go to the grave. But when we are in Jesus, we are complete. You're not going to have that empty feeling because you know who it is that you belong to. You know where you're going to go for eternity. And so in Christ, 
we see that we are complete. So there's nothing left out. We're complete. Outside of Christ, we're empty. We're going to be incomplete. We're not going to be satisfied. We're never going to be um, at peace like we will be if we're in Christ. Okay? Our next verse we're going to look at is 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. So if we are in Christ, our slate has been wiped clean, and we become a new creature, and we will live our lives for Christ. And so we can see that once we are put into Christ, that again, we are a new creation. Again, our old man is done away with. Now we're living for God. We have power over sin, and we know that the devil no longer has power over us. If we resist him in the faith, he must flee. So, new creation in Christ. But, if we choose to not be in Christ, and it's up to us to choose, again, we're just our same old self, our same old creation. Nothing has changed. All right, let's look at our next verse. It's Ephesians 1 and verse number 7. In Him, we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of His grace. So if we're in Christ, we have been redeemed by His blood and have forgiveness of our sins. And that's something that we definitely want because you can't be in heaven if you haven't been redeemed or have the forgiveness of your sins. So again, very quickly, we in Christ, you find redemption and the forgiveness of sins. It's the only place it's found. And of course, the opposite is true. On the outside of Christ, there is no redemption or forgiveness of sin. Again, it's as simple as that. Okay, let's consider another passage. 2 Timothy 2, verse number 10. Therefore, I endure all things for the sake of the elect, that they also may obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal joy. And so you cannot be saved without being in Christ. I mean, that's where salvation is. So I already, already saw it, that's where forgiveness of sins is, and that's when salvation occurs. And so very quickly, salvation, the only place you're going to find that is in Christ. And of course, outside of Christ, if you're not in there, then there is no salvation. All right, let's look at another passage. 1 John 5, verse 11. And this is the testimony that God has given us eternal life. And this life is in His Son. You know, only those that are in Christ can have eternal life in heaven. But those outside of life, they will also have eternal life. But unfortunately for them, it's going to be in hell. Matthew 25, verse 46. So very easily we can see that eternal life, that uh, makes it to where you're going to have eternal life in heaven, that can only be found if you're in Christ. And of course, even those who are wicked, they also, the Bible tells, they're going to be raised. They're going to have eternal bodies as well. And they're going to spend eternity in hell. And so that's what happens if you're outside of Christ. You don't live for God. That's where you're going to spend your eternity. All right? Let's look at another passage. Romans 8, verse number 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. If you are in Christ on the day of judgment, you will not be condemned to hell. But if you are not in Christ, then you will be condemned to hell, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So in Christ, there is no condemnation. Outside of Christ, you're condemned. You have condemnation. And just like we've been pointing out, when you're outside of Christ, that leads to eternity in hell. All right, let's look at one more. Revelation 14, verse 13. Then I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, Right, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. So those who live faithful lives and are found in Christ when they die, 
they will surely be blessed because they will have all the things that are found in Christ. But those who die who are not in Christ, they are not blessed and they will have all the things that are found outside of Christ. And so if you're in Christ, you're going to be blessed at your death. But if you are not in Christ, you're not going to be blessed. And so I ask you, which one do you want to be in? Do you want to be in Christ where all these wonderful things are found, eternity, forgiveness of sins, being able to be redeemed, being able to be in heaven forever, to be able to be blessed at your death? Or do you want to be over here where the world is, outside of Christ, where there's condemnation, eternity, and hell, and all you don't have access to any of the spiritual blessings. You don't have access to anything that has to do with Christ. Well, I think the answer should be very simple. I would hope that everyone would want to be in Christ. That is the best possible place that you could be. So the question is, is how do you get into Christ? You know, you can search high and you can search low, but you will discover that baptism is what puts you into Christ. Galatians 3, verse 27, For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Romans 6, verse 3, Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ, Jesus, were baptized into his death? It is easy to see that it is at the point of baptism that you enter into Christ. That's what those passages told us, if you just take them for what they say. Now verse 4 in our text there says, Therefore we are buried with him through baptism in death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. For he who has died has been freed from sin. Now if we die with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. You know, when we are baptized, we are emulating Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. We are symbolically dying with Christ, crucifying our old selves with Christ, and being raised as a new creature freed from sin. I mean, Paul makes it very clear there in Romans chapter 6 of all those things that are happening to us. And it's at the point of our baptism. Now, some people like to claim that baptism is a work of man and therefore cannot be part of salvation. But let's take a look at Colossians 2 and verse 11. In him you were also circumcised with the circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, in which you also were raised with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. So Paul shows us two things here. We see our faith working with our baptism, and we learn that baptism is not a work of man, but a work of God. Verse 13 says, And you being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he is made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. So it is through our faith in the operation of God that when we are baptized, we know that we are being joined together with Christ and that our sins are being removed. And so think about that. God is the one that's doing everything to us. Yes, we have to get into the water. Uh, someone can, is aiding us, making sure we're fully immersed. But that within itself is not, is not what's washing us with the blood of Christ. That's not when we're entering into Christ. It's God that's making that happen. Because once we are buried with Christ, where God has said, this is where you're going to be saved, this is where your sins are going to be washed, and you go down to that water, everything that happens to us when, uh, that we read in Romans chapter 6 is being done by God. By our, we're putting our faith in God that He's doing that. And so it is not a work of man. It is a work of God. Now I want to offer one more point to show that baptism is the point that we are saved and our sins are washed away. If you look at Acts chapter 22 and verse number 16, it will show very clearly using Saul's conversion that Baptism is when our sins are washed away. But before I read this passage, I want to add just a little bit of background. You know, Saul was on the road to Damascus 
when the Lord appeared to him and told him to wait at Damascus for further instructions. Now Saul didn't eat or drink for three days, and he was praying for three days. And we know that Paul believed in Jesus, and he obeyed his instructions, and he was obviously sorry for fighting against God because he fasted and prayed. Yet many in the religious world would say, yes, you know, Paul was saved at this time. He was a saved man. But we can know for sure that he was not because he had to hear more information of what he needed to know to be saved because it's up to man, that is men and women, to tell others about what they need to do to be saved. So Ananias is the man that Jesus sends to Saul to tell him what he must do. And when he gets there, this is what he tells him in Acts 22, verse 16. And now, why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Now ask yourself the question, when was Paul's sins washed away? The answer was, is when he was baptized. Now the grammar of these verses also tells us that Paul had to get up and go get himself baptized. So this is one way that we can know that this is talking about water baptism. Because if this was talking about Holy Spirit baptism, as some like to say, then he wouldn't have to get up and go anywhere. He could be standing on his head if he wanted to, and the Holy Spirit could be poured out on him. So we can know for sure that since he had to get up and go get himself baptized, that this is not talking about Holy Spirit baptism. It's water baptism. So Paul obeyed the gospel in the same way that Peter taught at the birth of the church in Acts 2 verse 38. Then Peter said to them, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So the Bible is clear. We must hear the Word of God, Romans 10 verse 17. We must believe that Jesus is the Son of God, John 8 verse 24. We must repent, Luke 13 3. We must confess Jesus as Lord, Romans 10 verse number 10. And we must be baptized into Christ to have our sins washed away and to become part of the church that he purchased with his blood. So think about that. Think about how simple this lesson is, but it's very clear from God's word to show what God's plan of salvation is. Now, if you're out there and you've never obeyed the gospel, maybe you just looked at one or two pieces of the puzzle. Someone told you that, oh, all you got to do is say a sinner's prayer. Sinner's prayer doesn't exist in the Bible. Or they say, just ask Jesus into your heart. Again, that's not found in the Bible. What did we learn from Saul's conversion? Remember, he prayed and fasted for three days. If anybody could have been saved from praying and fasting and doing all those things, it would have been Saul. But as we read in Acts 22, 16, he was not saved until he got himself up and went and got baptized for the forgiveness of his sins. And again, it's all of those things working together. You got to have the complete picture and not just one or two pieces of the puzzle. So I hope you will consider this lesson and you will think about this and study it out for yourself. If you really want to be pleasing to God, if you really want to be saved and you really want to be in Christ where all these blessings and all salvation, all these things are, then study it out. It's so important not to just listen to what people are telling you. What does God's Word say about salvation? And that's all I'm imploring you to do is to study God's Word, read it, and, and figure out that whole picture of what God says saves you and then follow that so that you can have access to everything that's in Christ. I appreciate you listening to my lesson and I hope you found it to be biblical and I hope it challenged you in some way. I would even be happy if it just made you think about your life or about God. I think it's important that we listen to and study God's Word as often as we can. Now one thing I want to make clear is that I don't want you to treat my Word as if it's the Word of God. I say this because I'm just a man. However, I will always do my best to study God's Word and to teach the truth. But I can make mistakes just like anyone else can. So always go to God's Word to confirm what I'm teaching. We all need to be good Bereans. If you find that I'm preaching something wrong, please let me know and be ready to show me from Scripture where I got it wrong. Because as a teacher of God, I know that I'll be judged with a harsher judgment by God. James 3, verse number 1. I would also greatly appreciate it if you would tell people about LG Ministry. You can find all my videos on YouTube. Just search by my name, 
or search by LG Ministry and you should easily find the channel. Or you can go to lgministry.org. Our lessons are seen by people all over the world. So I hope you will continue to watch our program and pray that we'll be able to plant God's Word for many years to come.